We're joined today by Thomas Ventura of Gensler. And Thomas, can you just tell us about yourself? Give us a little bit of what you're doing now at Gensler. And maybe if, if you want, I would love to hear sure. a little bit of your background on, on how you got to where you are. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been with Gensler now it'll be almost 10 years, um, it's almost a decade, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, about 30 years in the industry. Um, I started up in uh, Oregon, at University of Oregon, um, and then uh, was up there for about 14 years in Portland and then made my way back down to uh, Southern California by way of Northern California. So I worked for a couple different firms here and there, uh, but my focus primarily on mixed use, multifamily, and then eventually into hospitality, which is kind of my primary focus here at Gensler now. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of hospitality and mixed use planning, a lot of big projects, and, and I'm fortunate to be in the Newport Beach office, which has four studios, about 100 people total, um, but all the studios are kind of flex studios. So it's a wide range of projects from retail to hospitality and mixed use to office. So you get a, you get a little bit of everything, which is kind of fun, keeps it interesting. And, and Gensler is a small firm, right, when it comes to yeah. firms overall. G give us an idea of, the, of what yeah. Gensler looks like today. Yeah, right now, I think we, I don't know if we, we've actually hit 7,000. We're close to 7,000 employees. Wow. Dang. It's a massive firm. Uh, we've got, uh, I believe, over 50 offices now, maybe 51. Um, the newest, I think, we just opened in, in Riyadh, um, yeah. Saudi Arabia. Um, Gensler is kind of comprised of, of different regions, and then within each region, there's a hub office and then multiple offices. So I'm based in the southwest region. Um, the hub's L.A., um, but we've got L.A., Newport, San Diego, Vegas, Denver, and Phoenix in, in our region. Okay. So, and it's, right. it's, that's probably about 1,000 in the region. I just saw a news article recently about the L.A. office, and they're talking about redesign of that office. And, yep. and I'm sure that that's just a constant thing that's <laughs> going on at Gensler offices around the world. Yes. It's like, no, yes. and you're not only adding offices, but you've got to be constantly updating what the stock that yep. you have as well. It's just got to be a, a big ordeal. L.A.'s got a great, great location right on Figueroa yeah. downtown. And they've yep. got a, kind of the three-story, we call it the jewel box. And then they've got the they've got a connection back to the tower. And... But that was done, you know, probably almost almost ten years ago by now. So it's it's kind of the new refresh. We just went through a refresh here in the Newport Beach office, nice. as well. Just kind of updating technology, making sure we're up to speed, you know, making sure conference rooms are dialed in, um, yeah. making sure there's no coffee stains in the carpets, those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. Well, our main topic today is sustainability, and I know that sustainability has always been a big issue in the building industry. Maybe you could lay out just kind of the the landscape of, of what we're dealing with, with 2030 sure. and commitments and what firms are sure. doing to address this from an architectural perspective. Yeah, I mean, Gensler, their their mantra is, you know, basically change the world through the power of design, right? And so they recognize, especially the firm as large as they are, the, the global platform they have to really make an impact and specifically mm -hmm. with, with, with climate change. and. And the firm has um, has committed to what's called the GC3, so the um, Global Cities Challenge. So they, but basically by 2030, all of our projects are to be completely carbon neutral is, is kind of the, the charge. Is it possible? We're working towards that. Um, it's, it's a huge Herculean effort to do that, especially when you're looking at massive projects all the way down to the small tenant improvement. I mean, the, the range of projects is huge. So how do you right. do that across all that? Um, and so we're we're starting to implement some new some new practices with that. Um, obviously, we've got um, you know a lot of the push from the company to to really uh, have sustainability and resilience at the forefront of of what we do and, and embedded in all projects from the very beginning. So it's not just a greenwashing. Um, and so they're starting right now with what we're calling the GPS. So it's, it's the um, basically global product standards or specifications. So it's adapting all of our specifications. Um, to basically use the most sustainable and, and sort of game-changing uh, materials within the projects um, in order to, to reduce a lot of the embodied carbon in, 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 in the projects. Let, let me ask. So mm -hmm. I think we all know that, you know, one of the big challenges with going carbon neutral um, and implementing the, the, the 2030 challenge mm -hmm. across the board, both in the profession and in the offices themselves is really the knowledge of the staff, right? right. Because in a way, mm -hmm. you, you can only go so far with the kind of embedded knowledge. How are you guys right. ensuring that your staff is actually trained up on what it actually mm -hmm. means to go carbon neutral and support that challenge right. as you move forward? There's a huge effort by the firm to make sure everyone has a, a level of, of education on that. 
and I'm by no means an expert, mm -hmm. but one of the th ways is, is really just bringing awareness to it. And so that there's a constant effort to make wise material choices, make good design decisions based on the orientation of the building, the type of fenestration on whatever, you know, what elevation you have. But we have what we call design synergies. And so there's like a design experience, which is kind of more focused on the actual built environment, design purpose, which is kind of the why behind a project. Mm -hmm. But we also have design resilience where we have we have sustainability experts within within the office that will basically be embedded in each of the each of the the project teams, and as well as, you know, like a typical QC form, mm -hmm. QAQC, where we go through our project checks, you know, right, you right. typically have like a project manager, a project architect signing off on that. We mm -hmm. also have a process where we have review from the design directors, as well as the resilience director or resilience member, basically making sure uh, that the project is kind of hitting all the parameters that we want to do as, as a company. But there are, there's constant um, seminars, lunch and learns, opportunities for education um, throughout the firm um, in terms of bringing best sustainable practices together. We consistently try to gather as much metrics as we can mm -hmm. from all of our projects and, and working with the engineers to make sure that we're, we're specifying systems from an HVC standpoint, from a lighting standpoint, to have the, the least impact in terms of, of energy usage um, that, that we can. And we continue to collect those as data points. And with the, the, the broad range of projects we have, we can actually start to really see wh where the impact is happening across the portfolio of, of, of work. One of the things that when I was working in a f large firm was th that I thought was really an interesting shift culturally that I saw happening was that young graduates, emerging professionals just had this level of citizenship when it came to sustainability and environmentalism yeah. that we hadn't seen in previous generations. It was an ethos that they brought to the mm -hmm. firm and where, where you might have older generations and obviously totally generalizing here at this point, but it's, it was like an option on projects. Whereas with the younger generation, right. it was embodied in every single mm -hmm. project. It was table yeah. stakes. Like this is the direction we have to go. This is our world that we're going to be living in. It's our, kids and our grandchildren's world that they're going to be living in and really took it a lot more personally. I'm just wondering from your perspective, are you seeing something like that as well? Or have you seen that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's definitely a much more heightened sense of awareness from, from all of the, the younger staff coming in. Um, and certainly that's been a focus of, of a lot of the education that's happening through the universities. But it's definitely even here just been a complete culture shift um, to really make that a key focus on everything that we do. Like I said, from the very beginning, sort of the, the the base ideas of the project, there have to be some some measure of, of a sustainable goal. That's, mm -hmm. that's the ethos of each project and kind of the why of what we're doing. And you know, most of the time, clients will it resonates with the clients as well. And we try to we try to bring them along as as partners. Obviously, we have to the projects have to serve the client, right. but we want to be partners with the clients, and we want to have clients that align with our goals as well as us aligning with their goals as well. Right. So we're, tr we're trying to be a little selective with, with the clients as well as the, the employees yeah. to, to focus that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a, that's a, I don't know, sometimes maybe some architects might think that's kind of a privileged position to be in, but it's also, I, I, I know what you're saying. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. it has to be mutually beneficial. It's not yeah, right. completely one-sided. Yeah. You know? Let's talk about some of the stats that kind of drive this. Yeah. Two that are really like pretty important is if you look at sort of, the embodied carbon of a project, like 18% of, of, of carbon emissions is based on, on making a building, building a building. But if you look at the operational use of a building, about 40% of, yeah. of yeah. the carbon is, is from operation of the building. So if we can affect how buildings perform, it can drastically have a reduction in terms of the overall you know, carbon emissions for, the, for our projects and, and you know, ultimately just have a huge impact with, again, with the, the amount of work that we do as a firm. So we, we recognize that as a responsibility we have uh, as a firm. And, and that energy consumption really is like around the clock, right? I think that's one of the big yeah. things that we have to recognize. Yeah. I remember mm -hmm. even during the pandemic, during when, when nobody was in the office, that building was still, yeah. the lights were still turning on every day. The HVAC was mm -hmm. still running every day. It runs at night, so that the build, you know, during the summer, it's cool when you walk sure. in the doors in the morning. Uh, and ev again, even if nobody's showing up, and so these are the kinds of things that I think 
need to be top of mind for everybody who's practicing today, which mm -hmm. if, if there's anything we can do to lower those numbers, yep. it helps in really big ways because it really does add up. Huge. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that typically is kind of the kind of educational factor or educational point, talk, talking point, as we call it, when we're talking with clients, when they're asking us kind of like the why. Why is our first cost so high? You know, why are we spending this much right. for this? And having that conversation with them about the return on their investment, how quickly spending something that is more energy efficient in the long term, one, help reduce that 40% of the operation budget, but also start to see a return on their investment a lot quicker than if they just went with any manufacturer off the road. That's just your typical kind of like bargain basement, affordable, mm -hmm. you know, piece. Yeah. And, and a lot of that comes with one, just understanding kind of what the long-term goals of your client are, right? Yeah. Are, are they, is it a long-term hold? Are they, are they buying this? Are they developing a project for a quick sale? You know, and if that's the case, you still have to look at the performance metrics to actually make that a more, more valuable asset, mm. right? It, but, but really it's about working and, and partnering with, with good consultants, good engineers um, to kind of have a full strategy for, for each project. That, that makes a lot more sense in your sort of traditional building methods. Yeah. You know, you talked about having having buildings running 24-7. You know, there's ways, to obviously, to augment that. You know, we all know about motion sensors, turning the lights off when no one's no one's in the room. But also in terms of HVAC, having, you know, having night purges, you start to look at solars and battery systems and looking at all the systems, how they can kind of offset each other so that it's everything's operating as optimally as possible. But also, you know, those are all active systems. How do you design it for passive systems, mm -hmm. passive ventilation, passive cooling, not gaining the heat from solar? You know, there's a, there's a lot you can do in terms of the base level of design that yeah. is kind of old school design, if you will. Yeah, right? yeah. But it's trying to really pay attention to how the building's put together, so you're not so reliant on on the actual active systems. Yeah, start with a, passive design and then and then yeah. augment with active. Exactly. Yeah. Active exactly. Design. Yeah. Con constant conversation that we have with our own staff. But we also have that same conversation with our clients, too, so that they understand what the importance of the design decisions that we make are. One of the myths I think that that some have heard over the years is that and I you know, we talked a little bit about energy consumption for indoor spaces, but that there's there's some people see outdoor spaces, they see heaters running, they see lights on, they see all kinds of things, you know, air movement, you got to keep fans blowing and things like that. Mm -hmm. there, there's this idea that outdoor spaces also consume a lot of energy. And I'm sure in some cases that's true. But but generally, when we when we look at indoor versus outdoor, have you seen any shifts more towards outdoor because of the Absolutely. need for natural ventilation? I mean, obviously, we're still talking about passive design a lot of times totally. to yeah. to control sun and shade and and wind and things yeah. like that but what what do you what do you got from that side uh, of it absolutely i think in all of our projects across the board in terms all different practice areas whether it's hospitality office you know retail especially like dining there is always um a need for for good outdoor space and, and a demand for it now and especially like in light of with with COVID, it's like everybody's looking for the outdoor option, right? Because we we all moved to outdoors. We're having lunch in the parking lot, but no one wants to go back to going back inside because it was such a great space being outside and having. And you know, here here being in Southern California too, we have you know, the benefit of great weather, so that that helps. And with the expectation of having good outdoor space, there's also the people are a little more accommodating in terms of temperature swings mm -hmm. and and being. Not really uncomfortable, but but their range of comfort widens when you're outside because mm -hmm. the, ex the expectation that's not seventy two point six inside, right? Right. <laughs> right. You, it, it's gonna it's gonna vary. It, you know, you're gonna be in the sun. It's gonna be a little hotter. You're gonna be you know, a little more exposed. You may have some wind, and it's obviously you do things to control that and, and still make that a, a comfortable environment. But I think there's a little more tolerance for uh, for for some variety, <laughs> and that's and that's what people are searching for. Talk a little bit more about that. Like, what what are some of the design strategies for outdoor spaces? Because there's natural light, right? But you don't want 100% direct sunlight, right? Yeah. You you want to be able to control that. There's there's a need for temperature control. There's a need mm -hmm. for wind control, ventilation, things like that. When it comes yep. to yep. you know, like uh, people people do like fresh air too. So, but but yeah. but again, there's there's a range that people are comfortable with, right? And sure. the other thing I want to tag onto that before before you take it and run is Sure. You're seeing a lot of this in, in California, Southern California, as far because the, oh, yeah. the the temperate climate. 
But we're talking to other people in this series that are saying that across the country, people are asking for these types of spaces. Absolutely. And oh, absolutely. there's obviously seasonal differences, temperature differences, mm-hmm. but it, mm-hmm. the demand is still very high across the board. So taking absolutely. all that into account, I mean, what, what are you seeing? You're absolutely right. I mean, all, we, like I said, we do projects all over the, the country and all over the world, and we're absolutely seeing that in, in all, all climates, all project types, there is a, a, a need and appetite and a demand for, for good outdoor space. And you talked about a little bit about the design of that. I mean, it, the key is really pro- you, know, you start kind of with the light and the shadow, right? It's got to be well lit, but you don't want the glare. So you, this dappled light idea is is great. You have some access to shade, but still some access to to direct light. Should you want that, you know, ventilation's huge. Air movement's a big deal, but not too much. It's yeah. just enough that you have you have you know a comfort level there. Um, and then with that, you then you moderate the temperature. You know whether it's You've got a great breeze coming off, you know, uh, a, a bluff, or you know, or if you're in an urban environment, you know, how do you how do you screen those elements and, and actually provide a buffer from what's happening on the outside? So you kind of create a little microclimate within what you're designing is, is kind of key. So it's really understanding the context that you're designing for. Um, curious about, you know, you had mentioned that you or you guys just opened up a Riyadh office, and mm-hmm. just so happens that that is a project that I'm working on right now is a brand new university in Riyadh. And one of the things that, you know, we're, we're doing is very much to the point that you're just making is a lot of the exterior spaces are designed to be essentially, let's not say 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week kind of spaces, but pretty much where you're able to be outside comfortably during the day Mm -hmm. in some of the more scorching heat and be able to actually spend that time. Because one of the things that in the now three and a half years of working on this project and visiting uh, overseas quite often is that we'll have a lot of the exterior spaces really come to life once the sun goes down. Absolutely. And then it's, it's really kind of employing, okay, now we know that the desert doesn't really hold heat. So how do we make these spaces comfortable as well as just the whole gamut? I mean, are you seeing spaces like that throughout a lot of the projects that you're doing where, you know, you're, you're really yeah. trying to extend them, not just during like, you know, the, the daytime operations, but you know, really like all hours of the, of the day and night. Absolutely. I mean, and especially when you, when you look at Middle Eastern, even European countries, you know, it's, their schedule is a lot different than, than in the States. Yeah, right? Very much so. Dinner times an early dinner sometimes is 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, and especially like in the Middle East, like I travel quite a bit in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and, and You'd, you'd see families out there at 11 o'clock, oh, yeah, yeah. midnight, kicking a soccer ball around where they're having a barbecue until 2 in the morning. And that's just the normal course yeah. of, of, a, of a day. You know, obviously, the day starts, starts a little later. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's under, also understanding the culture you're designing in yes. and, yeah. and designing for. That's, that's a key thing. But absolutely, the, the need to try to activate at all hours of the day is is key. And, and obviously, like, we're looking at a, at a, at a project now um, here even locally in the Irvine where, you know, it's traditionally, it's an old traditional office park, tilt-up office building, two-story. But they're looking for ways, how do you activate this campus? How do you, you know, it's all about how to get people back to the office because mm-hmm. everyone's been home, you know, way. But it's it's really about creating a vibrant, active space that's not just about the office it's about it's a destination that you it's close to rooftop where people live it's it's you know there's great food and beverage there's great amenities on site there's a reason to be there after the eight to five and you're not there for the office and so it's it's trying to find ways to to use those in-between spaces within these campus settings that that you know really make this make the space come alive and, and a lot of it has to do with just making a mixed use you know so have, having a lot a lot more use than just office right it, it seems like there's a there's a lot of expectation from users now around the types of yeah. mix of spaces that they want to see in places. Absolutely. And corporate America, for this example, mm-hmm. is is having to react to that to like yeah. you said, like to entice people mm-hmm. back to the office. Right. And you're you're talking about a new office park, but I could also assume with yeah. with existing office parks that like they've got to find ways to do that. Can you just talk about well, those like? changing yeah, expectations well, in the marketplace absolutely. when it comes to uh, types of spaces that people want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the big things we're looking at, you know, certainly here in Orange County, but but nationally as well. There, there's a huge 
um, depression in the office market, right? Mm-hmm. Because offices that, that were totally full um, now are in a hybrid schedule, so you don't need as much work area or, or you know, floor area, or they're com- they're compressing, or, the, or they even closed certain wings. People just aren't coming yeah. back. Um, and the market that's out there is highly competitive. And so you've got a huge vacancy of the lease rates for, for offices. So we're seeing a lot of sort of office to resi type of conversions that are being looked at or office to, to hospitality or hospitality to resi. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. basically, there's a lot of crossover that's happening. And so in a lot of these office parks where there is a high vacancy and they are trying to entice people, a lot of times it's change of use that makes a huge difference. And it's not just the whole thing it's you know bits and pieces of that so you have a range and a variety of, of uses and that outdoor space is kind of what stitches and knits those all together it does seem like there's a lot of challenges in incorporating outdoor spaces just because of kind of baggage isn't the right word but but I, maybe maybe you understand what i mean it's like like this is how we've always done it right and so sure. this is a new component that we're adding in mm-hmm. and so a lot of times the outdoor spaces have been thought of as an afterthought or just a, you know, yeah. that those aren't something that are prioritized in the types of spaces that we need in our new building. But I think that's shifted. Right. Is that is that the case? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think, and again, I'll just look at the office market. If, if there's an expectation for a high, highly amenitized mm. outdoor space, mm-hmm. you know, and so the office isn't just the office anymore. You've got outdoor meeting rooms. You've got outdoor gathering spaces. You've got access to food and beverage, you know, if, company events. I mean, there's a lot of different things that that is an expectation for a lot of different users. Same thing for, for you know, your resi or your hospitality. Um, you, you, there's a certain expectation of, of having access and, and amenity outside. How much of that is driven by, like, mental health awareness, do you think? I mean, I, I, I'm just wondering. Well, like, because some, some is. And the, the reason I ask is because I know personally, like, I... I don't want to be, st- I, I work out of my house. Right? I don't want to be in my house all the time. And we've seen sure. tech companies for many years try to build it all into the one place. They've got the breakfast bar and they, they've got right. the cafe and they don't want people to leave, right? And, and I think right. working in architecture, we know what a, a long work day could possibly <laughs> sure. look like, right? Yeah. But we also okay. understand the need to get out. And like, if you're in an urban area, when I was working in LA, it was like, yeah, we go out and we walk and we go to lunch and we, you, you're on yeah. foot and you go somewhere to have that. And then you go back to the office and that does give you a yeah. chance to kind of do a mini reset during the middle of the day. Totally. Is, is that a big driver, do you think, to just people's awareness of their own I, kind of... I, I, I think it is both a conscious decision, but also subconscious need mm. that they just, they want to be outside. You know, it's, 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 that's how, it's why you get cabin fever, right? It's like you're yeah. cooped up, you need to get out. And it's like, you don't know why, but it's like, it, we, we need to have fresh air. We need vitamin D. We need to get out and, yeah. and, and out of just four walls. So I think, so I think it's that subconscious drive, but I think there, again, there is more of awareness. And I think that's starting to be programmed into a lot more spaces intentionally. And those spaces are now, able to kind of be monetized as well, which means that they're willing to put the investment in to do it right. Right. So how does these exterior spaces contribute or support the kind of sustainable aspect of your project designs? I think it it offers, again, a variety of spaces. It allows your large space inside to be extended into, so you have this great sort of indoor outdoor, and especially in this kind of market. Um, But it also helps reduce like the load on on the building in terms of how much energy is being used in the building. If you can bring in natural daylight, you can obviously reduce the amount of light levels that are needed. If you can bring in natural ventilation, it obviously augments what what's necessary for the HVAC system. Um, and again, once you start to now incorporate outdoor space with the indoor space, it's one sort of seamless piece. Again, it gets back to that sort of expectation of comfort mm. that people have. Right. There's more of an there's more of a tolerance now for people inside the building as well as what's happening outside the building. It also poses challenges security wise, though, right? Because you're potentially but, yeah. creating more connections indoor outdoor. You've that's, got stuff yeah. that's outside that you got to lock exactly. down or put. You know. So what what sure. about that side of it? That's a huge part of it. And I think that's part of the reluctance, probably, 
when you kind of think of the old the old way of thinking of it, right? It was always like, yeah, let's do a nice corporate campus, but it's locked down. You've got to have security badges to get it, and this is this is my space. Mm-hmm. No one else yeah. can join it, right? Mm-hmm. But now I think there's definitely more of this push for a communal space where it's the whole community that's part of this. Mm. And that's also part of the reason for having that 24-7 is that there's always eyes, right? There's always things that are happening. There's always things that are active and engaged. So security is part of that. Mm -hmm. But when you have a lot of people and a lot of activity that's happening, less opportunity. I mean, there's always opportunity for for that stuff to happen. But you know what I mean? There's there's always people that are present that, that may be more of a deterrent than you know, than not. Yeah, more. If you're like in an empty space trying to sneak into exactly. someplace. Exactly. Right? More, more eyes outside means kind of right. more eyes on points of right. entry and things like that. You mentioned earlier about kind of the picking the right products, right? You, you talked about, I don't know if, if Gensler has like a database where it's like people are applying to be part of it or how you're actually figuring out because there's, there's just so many products mm-hmm. out there. So maybe you can talk yeah. a little bit about that. But I, Cormac and I have both sure. worked in the K-12 and university schools. And, and one of the things that we've talked about many times on this podcast is how design decisions are driven by maintenance a lot of times because of mm-hmm. yeah. and, and so that's another way to to interpret sustainability yeah. right is is Schools how long are, are things going to last yeah. how long are they going to serve the client yeah. because this is expensive stuff yeah. right so oh, yeah. I, and, and so getting back to the product part of the question right is 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 that I kind of assume that's also part of it it's just that's a huge part of sustainability. Right. It's it's yeah. not about getting the cheapest thing out there. It's about getting things that are going to last. And and when you start thinking about design and like schools, obviously, are one, like one of the heaviest users of, of any yeah. material, any product, you'll, you'll yeah. wear it out the quickest. Probably second to that's hospitality. And so if you think about a hotel lobby and a chair, what does that chair have to upholster? What does that have to be right. in order to withstand as much use as it's going to get? But also that you're, it's not so trendy that it's going to be out of, out of date, out of design in a couple, a couple of years. So you want to pick timeless things that are going to last that also have durability as well as, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint, have, have a level of durability as well. But in terms of what we're doing, you um, mentioned the, the specifications. So, again, we've got the, the new GPS that we just kicked off in January, the global uh, product standards. And those are kind of they're, right now it's kind of in its infancy. So it's a small list of, of items, but it's about 12, 14 of sort of the most frequently used materials in, in buildings that could have sort of the biggest impact. You know, you look at your carpet, your carpet tiles, your ceiling tiles, your, your LVT, you know, those, those type of products that are sort of mass surfaces, mm-hmm. but that have huge impacts. It's, one, it's, it's durability. You, they need to, be, to have a certain level of durability so you're, they're not being changed out every couple of years. It has a five to 10 year you know, life cycle to that or even longer. You know, as well as just the style of, of it's got to be appropriate. So it has a timeless element to that. But also each product that we're requiring to have their own EPD. So which is kind of equate that as like the, the ingredients list when you buy a box of food. Right. It has everything on there. Well, products will have an EPD, which basically is a declaration of how the product was made, what's in the product, where is it manufactured. And that, that gives a specific rating based on those metrics. Mm-hmm. And so that goes into our database, which then we can say, okay, this is acceptable within, our, within the GPS standards or it's not acceptable, or it's a, it's a market differentiator where it actually is something we really want to push to use because it has that level of impact. And so that's what we're trying to do as well as um, to just educate the, the staff here as well to understand what products have sort of the, the biggest level of impact and really trying to push to, to use those type of products. And to your point, you know, vendors, we're trying to work with vendors um, to make sure they have the EPDs for their product, but also that they're trying to push to have a, a better, more sustainable product. Cormac mentioned earlier first costs, right? And, mm-hmm. and we're talking mm-hmm. about longer lasting building materials that may not be the cheapest. Mm-hmm. And so right, right. I'm wondering, you know, as an architect too, like we've had so many conversations with clients where sure. there are options of things that they can choose. And right. mm-hmm. oftentimes, especially in public work, they want to go with the cheaper option because of that first cost, but there are trade-offs. How do you have those right. conversations with clients? Because I think there's going to be a lot of architects who are listening to this show mm-hmm. and, and they're all going to be nodding along. Like this totally makes sense from yeah. our standpoint. And they're the ones... Sure the clients or have to spend the money and you have to have that conversation about long-term cost versus first cost. Yep. And, and I'm just wondering, are, what are some strategies that you employ during those conversations to kind of help paint that picture so they can make the right decision? It, start, it starts at the beginning. It's, it's you know, getting them to buy into 
what the project goals are from the very beginning, right? And so if you can if you can do that, and from a sustainability or resilience standpoint, you're, you're nine tenths of the way there because now you've got a partner in that. If if it's a hard sell at the very end, you said, oh by the way, we want to use these products because yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's because they're gonna because they're gonna you know make the building better, but but yeah, but I'm paying twenty percent more. Why am I gonna do that? They have to understand why and have a desire to have a building that wants to perform at a higher level from the beginning. So that's that's kind of the starting point, and it, it, it's just an education process through the whole the whole project. But I think architecture is as much of a business as it is a design profession, and you have to understand where their business is and understand the a little bit of the economics about that, so that you can you can. Be able to paint the case that, okay, if we're using this type of a product that's going to last X amount of years, you know, operationally, it's going to help you in the long run. You know, same thing when you're picking HVAC systems or lighting systems. You're looking at the overall performance of the building. The same approach is with materials. Things that are going to be part of the building for a longer period of time. You're not going to have renovations for, you know, for a longer period of time. As you, the building has a, a larger, a longer lifespan. <laughs> And lower maintenance is, is kind of the, the key. So if you can start to help paint the picture for them, as far as ha- what's the value for a better quality product and a better quality design, yeah. then it, that's kind of the starting point there. I think it's always kind of driving home that 40%, you know, as part of like the overall operation. And then how yeah. does that impact their operations, the exactly. finances to just maintain the building, to potentially have to replace a piece of equipment or something that maybe is a little bit more expensive, has a different type of maintenance regime than other things. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's just that we always, you know, talk about, and I know everybody, you know, all architects try to be transparent about the materials that you use throughout mm-hmm. from day one. You, you said it perfectly, yeah. you know, setting a goal on day one and really kind of talking about that and then reinforcing it throughout all of the different stages about how you're supporting that initial goal. And then if it comes up to like, oh, well, we've decided that we had to go this route rather than this route, but at least telling them how it's supporting the goal. I think there's another part of it, too, that it it can be a little more self-serving, but but again, it's knowing your client. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Knowing what what their goals are. But if there's a way that their efforts are are recognized and set them apart as a differentiator as well. You know that that's something that could be part of their part of their branding oh, yeah. effort, part Absolutely. of their marketing effort. It can be something that provides them some tax benefits or even development benefits. Yeah. So it's it's trying to under, look at all the different avenues that like, again you can help the client make that decision and help them make the right decision. One of the things uh, that both of you guys were talking about a little bit earlier is you know about like how the younger architects, emerging professionals, are coming in with this kind of like goal of sustainability as something that they learn in school. And one of the things that we've noticed, because we do a lot of uh, what we do all, higher education work. And, you know, one of the things that we try to to do with a client is really talk to them about, you know, the, the sustainability goals and how they can reinforce it. But they do absolutely use that as a as some form of marketing one way, either whether it's, you know, pulling in donors or, you know, pulling in students to like attract the best, mm-hmm. you know, the best students, the best you know, donors, the, the best mm-hmm. principal investigators, all of these things that are able to like say, okay, I'm working for a company that is on the forefront of sustainability and really takes the future yeah. of the environment seriously. It's one of the one things I love about working with Gensler is that, again, because as large as they are, it, it affords you a lot of resources mm-hmm. um, and a lot of tools to do what we do. And there is a very strong push for research and for kind of pushing the boundary in design, but also but just in, in looking at new print, new ways of doing things, trying to be as innovative as possible, whether it's partnering with another firm, whether it's doing internal research. Um, but the, every year we, we, we have a, a basically a research grant that we, we put out and it allows younger staff as well as older staff to, to want to part and kind of create up with, come up with, you know, just new and innovative ideas, and, and the firm really celebrates that, and, and it's it, it's kind of part of the culture here, which which I which I really love, and I think is is refreshing to a lot of younger younger employees coming coming right out of school because it, it kind of still has this some level of sort of that academic academic pursuit, right, yeah. and striving for for new things and study. 
and some of that research gets published externally, right? Like that yes, it's not yeah. just an internal thing. I, I know I've Correct. consumed those research reports too. You'll do a workplace yeah. study. You'd, yeah. And, and mm-hmm. so I, you maybe talk a little bit more about that because I think it's a great plug right now. Yeah, I mean, we do, we do a lot of that. So each, each, of the, each of the practice areas that we have, we kind of look at, you know, design called design forecast. And so there's a design forecast for so what are the new trends coming out? What are, what are the kind of the, the hot topics or key topics that are going to be driving design for, for us as a firm, but also just in the industry at, at large? There's also our, our research catalog that's published every year as well that kind of has a result of a lot of those research grants that are a lot more in depth, a lot more in the weeds. But it allows us to basically ha- just continue to catalog some just some great in-depth knowledge um, that kind of help us be a market leader in, in a lot of the different uh, practice areas. The thing that I love about that is one of the things Evan and I talk about a lot on the podcast is sometimes the lack of research and development from the AE community, you know, more of the architectural community. And this is somewhat self-serving because it's like, okay, how do we push our design? But we push our design in high performance, in sustainability and things like that. But then in turn, what it does is it basically shows you can do an all curtain wall with some kind of scrim over it and all that other stuff. But how does that benefit the overall like support of sustainability, the overall support of, of the resilience that, you know, you were talking about? And, and these are the things that, you know, I'm kind of glad that firms are taking the leadership role in the research and development side of the future of the, of the practice. Yeah, agreed. I, it just, it, I, I'm very, uh, very fortunate and blessed to be, yeah. be part of it. So I, I enjoy working here. It's great. One of the things that I want to touch on is just, we, we, we touched on it earlier, which was kind of just the kind of afterthought that outdoor space with the combination, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a new campus, mm-hmm. like you brought up earlier, and how those spaces are outfitted versus what people are kind of expecting nowadays. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about what types of things you're doing in those spaces with building products, things that you're seeing in that sure. area to make those places to, to ensure that they actually get used. I think that's one of the things that, that a lot of clients have a concern over is that they're going to spend money on a space. Right. They're not going to put enough into it to, to truly make it a destination of a feel for, right. for someone to actually use it. And then they, it's a c- complete waste of money. But I know that there's strategies that are employed to yeah. ensure usefulness of those. So I'd love to hear what, yeah. what you're doing there. I think it starts with making a space you want to be in. And so sometimes it starts with, you know, a great view. Sometimes it starts with a destination that you've kind of created that's that's kind of removed from everything. Like if you're, mm-hmm. again, like in your urban environment, you want this little oasis. So you're looking for things that are, one, it's a discovery, right? And it's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I, I, I you want to spend it. But then once you're there, it's got to be a comfortable space. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's got to it's got to engage all your senses, right? It's, it's got to be pleasant place to be in, pleasant to look at. You know, we we look at outdoor spaces with the ability of kind of, you know, integrating with the landscape in terms of the the, the, the smell and the olfactory senses and being able to to have this sort of great experience, water, the sound, the sound of water or wind coming through a certain type of tree. Like there's all those sort of senses that you really have to start to curate that experience. And so as long as you're really paying attention to all of those, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a a recipe for success but again it's at the end of it it's got to be a place you want to be it's also knowing the type of space is it meant to be a contemplative space mm-hmm. for a singular or is it meant to be a loud space with a lot of people and so it's, it's kind of tuning it for what you what, what you're trying to create i like how you started that off because i immediately thought of spaces that i've been to where it's like seattle or san francisco or, or it could be mm-hmm. my, my local town where it's like you f- you feel like you found something special and that yeah. was the initial yes. draw but then you have to really follow that up with the things yeah. that will keep you there and keep it useful for you. Mm-hmm. And then there's there's also the kind of unseen stuff, like, you know, is there background music? Are there are there things that are exactly. is there Wi-Fi, right? Connectivity. Mm-hmm. There is it is it a, are there comfortable options to sit depending you, on what you, I want to do? Only, you only notice it when it's not there. Right. right. <laughs> True. Right. <laughs> the True. absence of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So it had, I think, and I think there's an expectation for all of those things. Yeah. You know, there's an expectation. I can, I can get onto a Wi-Fi signal. There's an expectation. Or if it's specifically to disengage, there's an expectation there isn't one, right? You don't have phone reception. Right. So yeah. It, it's, it, again, it's understanding it's what goal. you're designing that space for. Right. Yeah. And then environmental constraints, uh, you know, bringing it back mm-hmm. to kind of 
across the nation, across the world, mm-hmm. and really understanding the microclimate of the area, mm-hmm. really understanding the useful hours and how you can sure. how you can really make it work for for as much time as possible. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, thermal comfort is probably key to that. You know, whether it's if you're in a hot environment, providing shade, providing air movement so that you can bring the temperatures down, the ambient temperature down, or maybe introduce some, some cooling through water. Um, or if it's getting, you know, nighttime hours, it's getting cold. How do you, do you, you have access to natural light or do you, do you augment that with, you know, different heating elements, whether it's fire or actual, you know, heater element of, of some sort. There's a lot of different ways that obviously we can, we can do that. But I think ultimately it wants to be an integrated solution to, to make it, more impactful you know and and just bringing that back to sustainability like even thinking about thermal mass right coming Mm -hmm. like 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 going back to those passive design principles for Mm -hmm. for how how can we create a heat sink so that this will be a more comfortable space through more hours of the night for example right right or you know well talk about like like a a trome wall right like during the day you think about this big massive piece that's collecting sun at one point but it's providing shade in the hot hours of the day and the night hours it's hopefully radiating that heat back if it's designed properly right. not yeah, enough it's, people it's absolutely not enough people talk about the trom wall <laughs> <laughs> not enough yeah I, i'm a i'm an oregon duck I, I graduated up in eugene so we talked a lot about trom walls up there i'm yeah. a, i'm an auburn tiger and we talk about trom walls too <laughs> <laughs> awesome I, maybe we'll just finish up with with the future of of mm-hmm. this kind of sustainability aspect and where you see things going with indoor outdoor expectations of what people are looking for with offices and shopping like there's what I think we're really seeing is a convergence of a lot of different types mm-hmm. of space design and incorporating a yeah. lot of multiple use zones into a lot of these mm-hmm. where things used to be really specific use cases. But right. I'm really curious because Gensler touches so many projects in so many yeah. markets. If you were really seeing trends. I, I think you think you said it. I think it had, they, they we're looking at very flexible spaces, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, there aren't many one liners anymore. Things have to be multiple uses, very, able to adapt and convert and with that being from a use standpoint as well as from a thermal standpoint from you know inside outside being able to expand a room contract a room um, or a space it's i think there's there's a lot of need to do that just because the buildings are becoming so expensive to to build and to operate mm-hmm. and it's it, the 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 more bang you can get for the buck I, th- I think the better the more value you bring to the client to the space and so yeah i, th- I think there's definitely a need for Fully considering all aspects of, of a design. It, it, again, it's not it's not the one liner space anymore. And it's not just trying to be clever for being clever's sake, right? It really yeah. is about doubling Function. the value of these things, yeah, or or even more, because that's when owners, because they're spending more more money on this than anything they've ever right. spent any money on, right? And so right, it's right. like right. when when you can really make things double the value because of the flexibility, or because yeah. of the adaptability, or because of you know, this can be used for lots of different types of things. I think those are really mm-hmm. the things that they notice and, and are willing to spend a little bit more on than they would on the baseline. Mm-hmm. But but it's kind of has to be like a double value, a twofer, <laughs> right? But it allows it allows you to have operations beyond just the normal window that was typically there. Mm-hmm. Right? We talked about having these campuses that are open, you know, 24-7. Well, that same space can't function 24-7 the same right. way. Right. If it's truly engaged in the environment and part of the place that it's designed for, right? It has to breathe. It has to move. It has to adapt, just like we do. And so it's thinking of the building as an organism, if you will, and, and having the ability of, of opening, contracting, opening, closing, that, that allows it to engage and adapt as the environment changes and adapts. That's like a perfect place to wrap it up. I think that was that felt really good. So, Thomas, thank you so much cool. for yeah. taking course. the time to spend with us and share some amazing insight yeah. into the, the amount of work that you and guys are pleasure. doing. So, again, thanks Great. for hanging out with us today. Absolutely. Cool. Pleasure.